Hi everyone, my name is Charlie and once again we're in my father's bedroom. I will get that box cleaned off in my room eventually. Indeed, as I only have one more day off, one full day off before I am due back at work on Friday, I am considering going through some of the boxes that I have in front of a certain bookcase because if you saw my charity shop book haul then you will have seen that there were a lot of books there and some of them I've now accumulated so many that I have begun to forget the ones that I have purchased so I really need to do a proper recce of that and see whether there is stuff that I'm still interested in or if there's a lot of stuff that can go back to the charity shop because once again I am overwhelmed by the number of unread books piling up in my bedroom and if I was actually reading the books I owned that would be a good thing but I seem to be intent on getting books from the library and reading them instead when I have shelves upon shelves full of unread books. I think when I last spoke to you I had started reading Old God's Time by Sebastian Barry and I did go on to finish it that day this actually ended up surprising me, as a few of the Booker books have done this year. This was long listed for the Booker Prize, and I wanted to get this finished because a few of the books that I read within the last week were due back at the library yesterday, so they took priority. Old God's Time surprised me in that originally this was one of the four books that I read in the last week that was actually at the bottom of my predictions of books that I would like that were on this long list. This came from having read Days Without End a few years ago and not enjoying that book. However, with Old God's Time, what I found from the beginning was that I really enjoyed the narratorial voice and I found myself reminded of a Briefing for a Descent into Hell uh, by Doris Lessing, which is something that I said last week, but it wasn't necessarily due to content within the book. It was specifically to do with the way that I felt. I found that the way that this book went all over the place confounded me. I began to question what was real and what was imagined um, in this character's mind. It, it's a book that I believe that you would get more out of upon a reread because I am certain there are going to be little motifs and things here and there dotted around so that you can try and figure everything out. I just really ended up enjoying this novel, enjoying the narration, and it did have incredibly dark things going on within the book. Indeed, there is something that happens with in the midway point of this book, which left me feeling mildly nauseous, and I had invading upon my mind for a few days afterwards due to something that was happening and what was being commented on. There is an event that happens in this book that I also saw happening in another book which was This Other Eden which we'll talk about um, later on. I wondered whether this was the link between the books that had inspired the judges to put this on the book along list. However, I'm also aware that this might not necessarily be a book for everybody because it is so confounding. It does go around the houses. It can be a bit verbose, grandiloquent, and the sentences, as I said last week, can be somewhat labyrinthine, but it appealed to my sensibilities. The next book that I read was Western Lane by Chetna Maru, and unfortunately I really did not care for this book. Uh, so we have a grieving family and the father decides that he is going to give his daughters a regime where which every spare moment they have they are playing squash and it becomes synonymous with grief and we've seen this done before in fiction and as I said last week it's I don't mind when something's been done before as long as it's done well and what I keep saying about this book is that I could tell the author had previously written short stories because she does this thing which a lot of short story writers do which is just present you with the actions and the facts and it just felt a bit lacking and it felt very plain and without any sort of emotion at all and I get that sometimes people can feel like that with grief and maybe that was a good representation of that. It's an incredibly quick book to read but for me it lacked substance and was somewhat predictable and I didn't care for it. 
I do think it would have been better had it all been condensed down into just one short story as opposed to trying to create an entire novel out of something that really didn't have the strength of a story to keep it going for so long. Uh, then I listened to the audiobook of Mostly Harmless by Douglas Adams. I was listening to this last week and I finished it and unfortunately it was not a good end for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series of the books that Douglas Adams wrote. I know that the radio play that is based upon Mostly Harmless does change the ending to give it more of the sense that Douglas Adams wished to give it before he wrote the book and I know that Owen Colfer has a sequel as well which I do intend to listen to but specifically based on the books that Douglas Adams wrote I found this a disappointment I thought that there was a tonal shift I thought there were language choices used that just didn't fit with the books I don't understand how the characters reached this point a character that I've been longing to see for ages turned up and it felt like she'd just been forced into the narrative and did no longer feel like the character that we'd known before it felt messy and it felt like this series probably should not have gone on this long. Indeed, the television series ended where the restaurant at the end of the universe ended, and I'm beginning to wish that this is where this series might have ended as well, although I did like Life, the Universe and everything. Then we come to The Bee Sting, which I believe is written by Paul Murray, and I was conflicted about this book. I knuckled down to read it as I thought that I would last Thursday to this Monday and this was 643 pages. I'm unsure whether it needed to be 643 pages. It is a chronicle of this family and we begin with Cass and then we move on to the mother, no, then we move on to the brother PJ, move on to the mother Imelda and then go to the father Dickie and the are a lot of themes within this book, a lot of things going on. It's um, a family where you get the sensation that if they just talk to each other, everything would be okay. With the parents, you go back in time to see how they came to meet one another, how they came to be married, and you get to see their adolescence. And I guess that the author was trying to show the mirroring of the parents' adolescence and the children's. But I'm just not sure that this book needed to be so long. I'm not sure that we needed to see all these different tales of childhood. At the end, I understood why we got shown Dickie's adolescence and him going off to Dublin. But at the same time, I did wonder whether there was something crass within his story, whether the author had thought about the fact that he called his two gay characters Dickie and Willie. Um, I don't know whether he was trying to have something fun there, but to me it just felt a bit um, too on the nose. And also it wasn't really a subject that was, it wasn't a subject that I feel the author dealt with well. I feel quite honestly this is a problem I see with debut novels and for this to be the author's, I think, third novel, it seemed weird that he would throw everything in the kitchen sink into one book, meaning that he doesn't properly examine everything that he's including in his book. At the same time, I questioned why I was questioning things, because when it comes to Dickens or Trollope, I don't have a problem with reading their huge, hefty tomes. But I'm not sure they meander as much as this. I just wish that the author maybe had gone through this and thought what's actually necessary to this story because the story of Dickie the father I feel like could have been its own book and almost wish it had been, almost wish the author had just taken that entire section and that entire story and examined it further and just forgotten everything else because at the end of the day there really doesn't seem to be any point to this narrative other than to show you this family and their exploits and it just yeah the, the more I think about this the more it goes further down my list I did enjoy the final 150 pages indeed I got through this book relatively quickly and I did like what I read but the more that I mull over this book the further down my list of estimations it goes although at one point it did hold the number one spot um of the book of books that I was reading. By no means bad, but is it one that I'm going to revisit in future? I don't think so. I 
don't have the impetus to go and read anything more by the author having read this book. While I can see what the author was trying to get at with certain characters, such as examining a father's internalised homophobia and then going and talking about his daughter's burgeoning sexuality and the way in which a, the daughter might be attracted to a character who is somewhat similar to her mother. Uh, and then you can question the way in which a certain character looks at Cass's mother based on who their daughter is. There's that's, you know, there's a lot going on about attraction and people not talking to each other. It just felt like all these plots and strands were pulled together, but they didn't really go anywhere. It was like a spider creating a web and not catching any flies. It just didn't really have any point. And for 643 pages, I feel like there needs to be a blasted point. Next, we have a book that was right at the bottom of my predictions when I originally predicted how I would feel about the book of books. This was my bottom book. This was number 13 out of 13. I did not think I was going to like this book and it's currently in first place as my favourite of the book of books that I've read so far. And that is This Other Eden by Paul Harding. I really did not expect to like this book because um, based on Kieran of KD Books, his plet group, based on people going on about apple grafting and the way that this book doesn't have the science correct for that, I really thought that I was going to dislike this book, especially as somebody who wholeheartedly goes on about um, research and how much I appreciate people getting things right. Now the apples in this book are really such a small part. I mean, they take up, what, two pages? Everything else is about these people who live on Apple Island who are being evicted. And they're being evicted because it seems that the people on the mainland have declared them savages based on their skin colour and based on the way in which they live. Firstly, I read this book in one sitting. I kept putting it down and thinking, no, everyone's saying to DNF this, you aren't going to like it, just DNF it, don't waste your time on it. But I couldn't do that because I ended up heavily enveloped by this story. I really liked the way in which Harding wrote. I appreciated the poetry within the prose. I liked that it wasn't necessarily a story about these people being evicted, but giving them a character. I admit that I can understand people's reticence to read this book because it is a white man talking about racism, but then that brings up the whole conversation of who can write what book. When it came to The Sweetness of Water a few years back, I found myself dismayed because the writer had chosen to call the racist character evil and I was thinking due to the time in which this book was written people wouldn't necessarily have had that opinion and a reader who can see the actions of a character can make that decision and that connection themselves and what I appreciated about the way in which Harding wrote this book and I would say that he did it delicately and as inoffensively as possible was presenting the reader with the facts of what had happened and what had gone on and allowing them to make their own decisions on what was happening. I also like the way in which he had crafted this story and this tale and from the beginning the reader knows what's going to happen. They, You know the ending, that is not what this book is about. This book is about um, creating a community really and that is what happens and makes certain events that happen towards the end of the novel for me at least a little more sad a little more bleak because everything felt bleak already and then certain events happen and it just feels like at times nothing has changed in terms of people's opinions and so for me this is at the top of my list in terms of the books that i've read for the booker prize so far and another book that I read incredibly quickly, indeed I got it from the library yesterday and read it in 90 minutes after I got home, was Study for Obedience by Sarah Bernstein. For me, this is the book that I wish Cursed Bread had been. It had a folk horror aspect. We're following a woman who has accepted a job to be her brother's housekeeper. And in the beginning, we are made to feel somewhat sympathetic towards this character because she has to do everything for her brother. She has to wash him, she has to feed him, she has to read the newspaper to him and his wife and children have fled and he's having to do this. 
But it seems that when she turns up in this um, Northern Irish community, strange things begin to happen to do with the livestock. The cows go mad. A dog begins to exhibit a phantom pregnancy. Things just aren't going well and I start pointing to her, towards her as being the reason behind this corruption. And I think that what works well for this book is the fact that it's so short. Similar to what I was saying with the Western Lane, for me, Western Lane was too long and should have been a short story. With this book, it was the perfect length because it's very much a get in, get out, make people feel uneasy and uncomfortable. I've seen some people haven't really been happy, happy with the way that this book meanders and you can go on for pages where it's just blocks of text without paragraphs. But for me, that added to the sense of claustrophobia and I found myself reminded of the folk horror film Ennis Men. Also reminded of Rachel Cusk in a way when she wrote the book, I think it's called The Country Life or This Country Life, because it's again had this meandering tone. And I don't know, for me there was just something incredibly dark that again suited my sensibilities. I, I like this tale but I also like the way that the author took the character on this journey from giving the reader sympathy for the character and then adding to this sense of unease because we're already on the character's side because we've seen them face adversity throughout their lives but then we're beginning to think but is this character actually the reason that all these bad things are happening and then certain things go on towards the end the tension turns another notch and you're just you leave the novel still supportive of the character but also wondering did she just cause did she cause all that bad stuff to happen was there some sort of devilry going on or are these people just superstitious because she's the new woman in town? I wholeheartedly adored this book. I uh, found two, not new favourites, but I found my two favourites so far from the book along list of this year and I can't lie to you, these four books from the book along list that I read this last week were the books that were at the bottom of my predictions, I thought that these were going to be the ones that I hated and they're currently my top four. Even The Bee Sting, despite my issues with that book, I do think that it was discussing some topics. Did it discuss them well? I don't know, but it just felt like it had more in it than some of the other books that I have read this year. Obviously that could all change when I read some more of the book along list and that hopefully at some point me and Charlie are going to record a video together, go over our thoughts on the books and then give you our predictions for the shortlist based on our Charlie and Charlie science list, which if you didn't know is where we rank the books ourselves and then allocate a certain number. So the book that, similar to Eurovision, the book that we both like the most will get 13 points and we work all the way down to one so the one we least like will get one point and this can change things um hopefully there are no drastic changes this year we found that we might not necessarily agree as much as we did last year i don't think we're going to be agreeing on who should be in the top spot but we will see when we get there in terms of writing i Continue to work on the second Ellis Valentine book, Mistakes Make Murder, but for the last three days I have been working more on poetry. This came from the fact that there were a few poetry magazines that I wished to submit to. This is also because I told Joy that I would have the manuscript for my poetry collection finished by the end of August, ready to share next week. I couldn't figure out the order and she said stop worrying about the order and you know me, I've been going on about the order of this for ages so I just put all of the titles into a random number generator and did it that way. I knew which poems that I wanted to start with and finish with so it was just a case of getting all of the ones in the middle and now I need to read through the thing and decide whether I think that the order's correct. It is nice to say that that's nearly finished. Will it be out at any point soon? I don't know as I said to you last week. I have also written four new poems and I think that I'm saying two of them I would say are definitely complete and will need very little redrafting but there are two where it's going to be completely 
okay, there are two where it's going to be a case of completely rewriting them because I just feel like in some cases there are poem there are poems where I've written them as one but they need to be two and in other cases that well there's one poem where I only like the last two lines and so I'm thinking of taking those last two lines and changing the entire just changing everything within the poem and making it something completely new and different but that's not happening at the moment because as I say my focus is on getting mistakes make murder finished otherwise I haven't had many new book acquisitions this week I haven't been at the charity shop to buy any and when I went to Waterstones yesterday the one book that I wanted to buy uh, they had but it had a torn cover and I was not spending near 20 pounds on a book with a torn cover however Audible did have their $2.99 sale on and I saw that they had the Brenda and Effie books by Paul Mars on there and I'm off to Whitby at some point this year hopefully based you know considering everything going on in my family at the moment I'm hoping to get there in October and the Brenda and Effie books I read I read the first two over a decade ago and then didn't go back but I really did enjoy them and it's about the Bride of Frankenstein opening a B&B &B in Whitby and when I sampled the audiobook, I really liked the voice of the narrator and so chose to download all of the ones that are available for 2 99 And if I enjoy this, then I'm just going to continue to listen to them, I think. But I believe that my mum actually has my copies of... What's, I, I can't remember what the first book's called, but I know that the second... Never the Bride and then Something Borrowed. Those are the books. And I think that my mum has them in her room. Meanwhile... I didn't do as much with my week off work as I had planned. Actually, I don't think I'd planned anything. Everybody always says when I take time off work, did you go for a day out? Did you do anything? I'm like, no, most of the time that I have weeks off like this, it's just about recalibrating really <laughs> and getting writing done and doing stuff around the house that I haven't necessarily got done. Uh, I didn't do any baking. I don't know what happened to the apples last week, but I didn't go and get them. So hopefully somebody used them. Hopefully they've not just been left to rot on the desk somewhere and that's what I've got to walk into on Friday. But I've done a lot of walking with Sal around the forest and down the towpath. Indeed, we have three days down the towpath because I'm aware of how busy the forest gets at weekends. And on Sunday, Sally got to meet her friend who she hasn't met. I call, her, call him her boyfriend because whenever they see each other, they just go a little bit wild and they were running up and down the towpath together. They hadn't seen each other in two months and I know that she was just ecstatic and the owner says to me about how you can't tell which one of there are no bad dogs there are only bad owners and he goes I don't know which one of that us that is and he's only having a joke because we're two of the people who don't mind when our dogs play with each other. There's this certain type of dog walker that wants their dog to stay by their side the entire time, does not want them to have any sort of interaction with another dog, does not want them to play with another dog. And I'm just like, you can't get anywhere with a dog that's not going to be sociable. And yes, so I was thrilled that they played together and then we went to Mac Forest yesterday and, well, we went on Monday, but it was, I knew I shouldn't, but I'd had enough days down the towpath and we went up on one day and it was so full. I mean, people were parking where they're not supposed to park. There are marked bays and they were blocking the road based on where they were parked. And I ended up driving around saying to Sal, we might not be able to park anywhere. And I saw this one space on a hill and I thought, well, I'm not going to go in there. And I turned around. I was like, oh, I'll just go in here. And the reason why was because I'd have to parallel park. And it's not that I can't parallel park. It's just that it takes my mind a while to get around it. And everyone, when I mention this, everyone says, well, just make them wait for you. You know, th their only option is to wait or crash. So anyway, parked, started walking south, and luckily no enough paths that I managed to not see too many people because it's not that I dislike people. I just know that a lot of the crowd who go up there on bank holidays are people who are only interested in getting photos for Instagram and it gets on my wick. So we did our walk, we came home, and then yesterday I did my long walk up to the benches and we met a whippet named Aji. And at first Sally was a bit wary of him, but then they got round to each other and the owner was happy because she said he's seven months old and he could clearly see that because my dog was calm, he calmed down. Uh, but I thought I'll let her go off on our walk and I got Sally's attention with a stick and everything was fine. But otherwise, yeah, my life has been walking the dog and writing and reading. And someone said to me recently, you have 
the perfect days. I would love to have quiet days like you. And I'm just like, hmm. Well, part of it's laziness and part of it's arthritis. So I'm not sure you want this at all, but good for you. <laughs> and also, you know, it can take a lot of a person can writing a novel and all the reading I've been... Do you know what? I've had a holiday. That's it. I just had a holiday at home is the only way I can say. I have one full day left of this holiday and this morning I was hoping that it was going to absolutely persist it down with rain today, meaning I could just be somewhat lackadaisical today. I did have the bath that I'd hoped to have. I didn't do much to my hair because, well, when it's got this long, there's just nothing that can be done to it. But <sighs> those are issues for another day. Uh, meanwhile, no new films watched. I've been watching the extended episodes of RuPaul's Drag Race season 15 and I'm glad that they did release these versions because it gives more of a fullness to the episodes. And I have been listening to Kate Bush. I have now listened to five of Kate Bush's ten albums and the whole reason behind this is the Spotify playlist. I was getting fed up of the playlist, always playing the same songs, and so I decided what I was going to do was just go and listen to the albums of people who I previously listened to one or two songs, and even though I've liked them, I've never gone and listened to any more of their work. So I did Hayley Kiyoko's albums, I did Rina Sawayama's albums, and now I have moved on to Kate Bush. And I'm beginning to see how she inspired a lot of the artists that I like, there are some times that her work has just been incredibly weird and my mind can't get wrapped around it, but there have been some interesting sounds in there. And as I say, for me, for the most part, it's, it's been something on in the background whilst I practice my Italian or I write, and it's been intriguing because I can definitely see how she did inspire other musicians, either, write, either releasing music today or over the last few decades. And there is a certain storytelling aspect. Whilst I was listening, I was wishing that Kate Bush had done the soundtrack to a horror film at some point because she has the mind that she knows how to use sound to create a certain type of emotion. And I don't think all musicians have that. But she definitely doesn't mind being a little bit experimental and I've enjoyed that. So that's that. I'll probably continue to get through all of them and just now be done. And then I'll move on to another singer, songwriter, musician person. I don't know who, but I'll do it. We've already done John Coltrane, so I don't know where we'll go next. Otherwise, that's me. Those are my reading updates and my writing updates and my listening updates. So what are you reading? What are you writing? What are you watching? And what are you listening to? I hope that you got something out of this video, even if it was just something to pass the time whilst you waited for an appendectomy. Because until next time, that is all.